well we are well into the 20th century and, uh, and at this point the artists will be rather tired of the, of the isms the uh, Impressionism, the Post-Impressionism, the Cubism, uh, all the isms and uh, meanwhile of course Herr Freud is scribbling uh, back in Vienna and the question now arises where do we go next? I mean all these experimental phases are all very well and good and they sort of open new doors here and there but suddenly we have so many new doors we don't know where to go it's becoming one huge labyrinth and uh, so why not choose something else uh, so the overriding uh, the overriding mood now now you remember how much Kandinsky was influenced um, by theosophy by uh, by Madame Blavatsky and it's still raging uh, at the turn of the century for whatever reason it really over overcame uh, everybody's mind and um, it's um, and also, as I said, Herr Freud is not far behind with his uh, subconscious. And um, I mean, over the centuries, essentially, people attempted to paint, uh, to paint something that they really didn't see. All the Christian visions, for instance, that go back to Byzantium or even the Western Christian visions, I mean, they didn't see any of that. They didn't see uh, Christ on the cross or, or lamenting of, uh, of Christ or or his disciples, or the Last Supper, I mean, none of it. They saw every, all of that was uh, imaginary. It's just that uh, uh, as Western art approached the Renaissance and beyond, they, uh, they attempted to do so in, in, in sort of a more naturalistic, in a more realistic, so to speak, fashion. But realistic it was not, of course, by definition. Even the idealistic landscapes, I mean, they're still idealistic, the landscapes, they're not exactly as the artist sees them, because he includes himself in it and his own thoughts. But now, of course, uh, their hands are pretty much free to do anything they want. They don't have to stick to the naturalistic tradition. Interestingly, the 20th century, that in terms of totalitarianism and, uh, and the attempt to control population and to whip it up into, uh, into sort of... Uh, army army like discipline by both Soviet Russia and fascist Germany uh, that's the century that came up with the most uh, irrational from the point of view of uh, naturalism irrationalist art so uh, this new idea or rather old idea um, began to circulate one artist who, uh, who span rather interestingly the idea of romanticism in the 19th century and then surrealism which will be the new ism after the First World War. And that man was Henri Rousseau, who was a Frenchman who spent most of his life working as, uh, in, the, um, in the customs office. And as a result, he was called Douanier, very kind of lovingly, because Douanier is a customs officer in, uh, in French. And the idea, the pre-surrealist idea, was that sincerity is to be found uh, not in learned, art, not in learned academies, but the sincerity is to be found in children's art, in the art of madmen, and in the art of the self-taught, uh, or as they call it, primitive. And it just so happened that uh, Henri Rousseau belonged to the latter category. He always liked to apply his pencils and paints to canvas, but you know, as long as he worked, he worked. But once he retired, he embraced uh, painting full time. And no, he was not taught. He was completely self-taught. When he first exhibited um, with the independent artists, uh, I mean, his art, of course, was, was completely ridiculed uh, by the general public and by the critics. But um, interestingly enough, uh, the painters themselves began to take him more and more seriously. Um, well, here he is. Uh, he paints him. See, this is his self-portrait, and uh, it looks as if he's floating. As you see, he doesn't even stand firmly on the ground, uh, he essentially portrays a silhouette, a silhouette of himself with no uh, modulated tonalities, no light and shadow, he is wearing a black suit, a black beret, uh, he is bearded, and this is 1889. And that's the year of that great um, Paris industrial exhibit for which the Eiffel Tower was built. And sure enough, there's the Eiffel Tower right behind uh, the uh, the multicolored flags on a little boat on the Seine, and you see a bit of Paris uh, and the balloon here, 
Uh, he is standing in front of one of the cast iron bridges, the Bridge of the Arts, uh, in Paris, and in his left hand, he is holding a palette with the names of his two wives on it, and um, and the paintbrush. I mean, excuse me, in his right hand, he's holding the, the paintbrush, and in his left hand, he's holding the, uh, the palette. He is uh, right in front of us. Uh, he is... Uh, front and center and uh, and as I said the the perspective is completely compressed and in your face the uh, the imagery is uh, is very flat but as a result there is this placing of imagery one on top of the other as uh, as if in a puzzle which gives it a very charming um, immediacy that we don't usually have in a sophisticated uh, art taught by the the academies. And his composition is, is, is wonderful. He clearly has the sense of the composition. Uh, he's got this balloon and the trees on the one side and Paris on the other side. And then his Eiffel Tower is there and he and he locks the uh, the painting uh, dead center. So the, the two, uh, he is the vertical, the bridge is the horizontal. And this kind of cross locks the whole composition of the painting very firmly. In it. But even before that, this is the painting actually that, the, that he submitted to the uh, exhibit of the independent artists, uh, derided by the critics and the public. But today, of course, with, with uh, about 150 years gone by, we we'll look at it with completely, with completely different eyes. Uh, the perspective here is, is in fact quite sophisticated. He, uh, he, he draws our eyes away from the, uh, uh, from the front plane into the background, and the background is very skillfully done because it's, it's, I mean, the middle ground, uh, because it's these bare trees that provide almost a theatrical screen, and our eyes then sort of travel between the trees into the background where what appears to be a, a, a dale uh, connects with the clouds above. And then, uh, and it is that part of the painting that is lit up. It's lit up by this lonely full moon and, and little um, stars around it, uh, whereas the... Uh, the front is uh, is darkened, and there's a darkened, uh, almost mysterious lean-to, in a way, uh, on the side, because it's not really a house. You can see through it. It's uh, it's just a roof. It's a roof with uh, with more of the uh, of the bush-like uh, trees around it, and there's just one lonely couple, and uh, and they uh, it's a carnival evening, so the couple is returning from a dress-up a dress-up carnival, and uh, and. Uh, they're both wearing the uh, costumes of the um, Italian Commedia dell'arte, which, as we saw, uh, all the painters love because they always represent this mystery of human emotion versus uh, human exhibition. And the two of them do not always coincide. But the colors are very clear. There's, uh, the, the contours also are very, very clear. There is nothing of, uh, of impressionism in it, or cubism, for that matter. It's really very much his own unique vision. And he was very proud of this vision, actually. He, he considered himself a very, um, an important painter. And uh, uh, at one point, uh, I think around 1906 or so, Picasso found one of his portraits uh, of someone else uh, in a shop and bought it for five francs. And then, uh, and then through a party, for Rousseau, where all the today famous dwellers of Montmartre showed up, and uh, it was his poem in honor of Rousseau. And Picasso at that time, of course, was very young. Rousseau was considerably older. But the last decade of his life, yes, he was in fact uh, appreciated. Well, Picasso himself at that time was considerably less appreciated. In 1906, he's just beginning. He, he, he showed that he's 26 years old, 25 years old. Uh, he had gone through his, you know, the, uh, the melancholy periods. But, uh, I mean, they're all, they're all doing it together, so to speak. But Rousseau's art is very, very different from all the ism. And uh, the term naïve was applied to it, perhaps. But, uh, but this naïveté has a degree of uh, very sincere, direct sophistication that today is appreciated considerably more than it was at the time when, uh, when it was created. And this is one of his... Uh, better known works and uh, and it seems that uh, that he found both of these there were just dolls in in a children's shop and he felt that could be interesting he spent i think he spent some time in mexico in um, uh, part of the french troops there and forever kept with him this nostalgia for uh, 
for different lands for, for something that's, uh, that's unlike uh, the environment of Paris or, or around Paris. And uh, basically what he said about this painting is, uh, Rousseau described his painting as follows, a wandering mandolin player, check, lies with her jar beside her, a vase with drinking water, overcome by fatigue in a deep sleep, a lion chances to pass by, pick up her scent, yet does not devour her. There's a, moon, a moonlight effect, very poetic. That's it. Uh, and quite a number of these of this painters, in fact, uh, Rousseau, Chagall, we'll be talking about Chagall presently, they essentially painted their visions, whatever those visions were, uh, and whether it was a childhood memory or something dreamt up, uh, we don't know. But they very much, uh, they in fact very much warn against reading more into their paintings than, uh, than is ostensibly there. Uh, and Chagall will do the same thing. Neither Rousseau nor Chagall uh, were moralists. They, as I said, they, they just painted what they saw. And uh, with Chagall in particular, of course, Cubism helped tremendously with Rousseau. Uh, he uh, he essentially did paint his own vision, and because he was never taught, Chagall in fact did take um, uh, drawing lessons, uh, painting lessons, uh, but Rousseau never did. So the um, scene is presented to us. There's uh, uh, there are undulating hills. There's a body of water, and then behind the water, the mountain sort of almost Cezanne-esque. And then um, the girl lies on the um, on the ground facing us, so we could see what she looks like. She has a mandolin with her and, uh, and, and her pillow. The stripes on the pillow match the stripes on her coat, sort of the multi-colored multi coat of the Near East. And then, uh, and then uh, the, a lion happens, happens to catch her scent and just comes over to check, to check it out, to see what's what. Again, very, very sharp contours. There's no question of diaphanous anything. There's no question of modulating contours. It's, everything is, is quite sharp. It's almost as if it's, it's, it's cut out. It's their, their cutouts. And then, then these cutouts are then painted and superimposed upon uh, one, one another. But uh, again, the composition is wonderful. It's almost as if the tip of the lion's uh, tail balances off. Again, the full moon. He loves his full moon and uh, kind of uh, paints uh, a face on it. Um, the stars are very widely dispersed. The color is modulated slightly, but not really that much. Uh, we see that the light from the moon seems to have reflected against the water and to the underbelly, literally the underbelly of the of the lion. And um, and then the left side of, of our sleeping lady is also uh, is also lit up. I mean, the whole thing is uh, just breathes with innocence and charm. And he also he loved the, the Paris Zoo and he loved the Paris Botanical Gardens and. Uh, and they're not far from one another, so as he walks in the, walked in the botanical gardens, he could hear the roar of the, uh, of the animals, uh, the caged animals in, uh, in the zoo. And there he conceived of tropical islands where he had never been, and tropical storm, and, uh, and tropical animals, and the native inhabitants, and all of that, of course, uh, uh, sort of prismatized in, um, in his mind, and there uh, here's a tiger <laughs> surprised in a, a tropical storm, and the title is his, Tiger in a Tropical Storm Surprised in 1891, and, and the whole thing is just overwhelmed with this with lush greenery. Uh, probably every piece of grass or any verdure that, that he saw in the botanical garden he, he included here, and the colors are uh, just very, very brilliant and, and very succulent, uh, just as the uh, tropical plants are succulent, his colors are succulent here as well. And there's the tiger, apparently the, uh, the, the storm came unexpectedly, whatever the tiger was doing, and the tiger just jumps up in surprise, particularly at the lightning. You see the lightning in the back, and that's what clearly made him so surprised. So he makes him jump up above all this lush greenery so we can observe his, him correctly. And yet the colors of the tiger and the greenery all comes together and makes a very sort of homogeneous picture of uh, exotic lands, and uh, but at the same time made easily comprehensible by his uh, by his way of conveying it and his way of uh, of drawing it. Another very famous painting of his, uh, and this is a view already in the 20th century. 
Uh, it's quite large. It's uh, seven feet by ten feet. That's a large painting. Uh, he is you now. That one was done in in uh, in ninety one. So we're almost twenty years ahead, and his uh, greenery has now become much more stylized and deeper in a sense. And and again, he's not inviting any any uh, subconscious interpretations he, uh, here whatsoever. In fact, he even um, wrote a little ditty, uh, a little poem, to explain what it's all about. And uh, suspecting that some viewers did not understand the painting, he wrote a poem to accompany it. Uh, it's called the Inscription pour aller, uh, the uh, explanation for the dream. And uh, here it is, Yadviga, his companion, is a beautiful, in a beautiful dream. So she was, we know immediately that she's dreaming it all up. And what comes to mind, but of course, Titian's Bacchanal of the Adrians, which is also kind of a dream, and obviously it's not a naturalistic setting. It's something that Titian dreamed up, also with a woman in a corner, nude, sleeping. And here, Yadviga, in a beautiful dream, having fallen gently to sleep, heard the sounds of a reed instrument played by a well-intentioned snake charmer, as the moon deflected on the rivers all flowers, the verdant trees, the wild snakes lend an ear to the joyous tunes of the instrument. So it's really about a woman sleeping and having a dream about uh, here's a native player over the reed instrument and it seems that everything is charmed by it. Not only snakes. Here we have a snake here. Then there's an elephant. We see an elephant and Yudviga, who is looking out to the player and kind of extending her arm towards him. And there, there are a couple of lionesses, it seems, and uh, as opposed to this painting where everything moves, everything moves along with the storm, uh, in the dream everything stills. Uh, it's the, the, this flute player, the snake charm, which charms not only nature, not only snakes, but charms all animals as well, and the trees, and us at the same time. Um, the, uh, again, he's just so good with his compositions. Uh, Yadviga is sitting on this couch that kind of doesn't really belong in the tropics, obviously. It belongs in, uh, in a fairly wealthy apartment in Paris, but this is where they are, the painter and uh, the model, and everything else is just dreamt up and dreamt up. And again, there's a moon uh, that, uh, that is lighting all of this up. And thus we go to uh, our next, uh, our next, uh, what, naive painter, or primitive painter, as they were called at the time. And he's Marc Chagall. And there's another charmed life for you. Uh, lived uh, almost to 100 years. He, uh, let's see, yeah, 98. Um, and really miraculously, because I mean, at least, uh, uh, at least someone like Matisse, uh, I mean, he, uh, he was French, so he was not, uh, he managed to, uh, to escape the wars because he was already too old for the first and obviously for the second, whereas uh, this is not the case. And uh, not only that, but Chagall was born in uh, Belarus, in, uh, in, in, the, in, the uh, in the Jewish part of, uh, of the country, in a town called Vitebsk. And Jews did not, really, did not have it very well in Russia, in fact, they were... They were persecuted and discriminated upon, uh, and there was this this widely spread racial prejudice against the Jews. But he took an opportunity of the uh, the warming up of um, of the political situation All right after the year nine hundred, and that's when the Jews were indeed allowed to come to large cities and uh, to enter professions and to enter universities. So he came to, I think, St. Petersburg, and he worked there for a while and, uh, and studied. He'll be very much involved with the Jewish theater. But at some point he will enter, he will enter the study of Leon Buxt, who was, uh, who was a brilliant um, th uh, theater decorator and was very much influenced by everything that went on in, um, in the West, in France. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, so Chagall was extremely inspired, uh, and the moment he could do it, he, uh, he left for France, and in France, in Paris, he joined, of course, the company of all the, uh, the forward-looking uh, artists and um, poets and uh, literary people. But uh, at the beginning of the First World War, he will go back to Russia, and because he left a girl there who he loved, by the name of Bella, and they will be married and uh, very, very happily 
married. He will stay in Russia through the whole war. I think he may, may have taken a couple of trips back to Paris while it was still possible, uh, because after the uh, communist revolution is in 1917, one could still travel if one had the means, because the society hasn't yet settled down in its, uh, in its re regimented autocratic uh, character, as will happen after uh, 1923. By, by the, but, but by that time, they all, Kandinsky, Malevich, Chagall, Lisitsky, they will all leave Russia by that time. They will all run away and settle either in Berlin or Paris or, or wherever it was safe. But what he will bring with him from Russia, he did everything, of course, the book illustration, mosaics, uh, stained glass windows, uh, printing, artistry, anything and everything. And, um, and being Jewish, it's just, it's, it's extraordinary that he, he, well, he avoided the First World War. He was one of the uh, uh, company of artists who applied for, uh, for asylum in America, and he was allowed to come in to America, whereas, of course, America turned, turned back, remember, ship that was bringing the Jewish refugees, and the Roosevelt turned, turned it back, so they went back to Europe, where, of course, they, they perished. So American behavior, on the whole, during the Second World War was not... Um, extraordinary to say the least. But they did take in those whom they considered uh, promising and advantageous to, uh, to, well, to the American interests, of course, and Chagall was one of them. So yes, he avoided the First World War. He, uh, he then came to America for the Second World War, and then the moment that the war was, open, uh, was over, he was back in France. I mean, he, he had no interest in staying in America. He just wanted to be in America while all of this, this, um, these events were taking place. In, uh, in Europe, but then he settled in the south of France, just as Matisse did, and lived uh, happily thereafter. Yes, and was widely uh, acclaimed and, uh, and very famous and very wealthy, all of the above. So there he is. Um, uh, art critic Robert Hughes referred to him as the quintessential Jewish artist of the uh, 20th century. And the reason for that is because, I mean, that's, uh, that's the background uh, that he uh, always fell back on. Uh, his Jewish Russian background. Uh, if you ever saw Fiddler on the Roof uh, in film or on stage, you pretty much will know what um, what Chagall's background was. He uh, in uh, in a place like Vitebsk, uh, which was um, the place of Jewish residency in uh, in Russia, because uh, until pretty much the revolution or close to the, the 20th century, the Jews were not allowed to live in large cities except if they were doctors somehow or, or wealthy. Otherwise, they, they lived in little towns like Anatevka in uh, the Fiddler on the Roof or Vitebsk. But nearby, right there, also were Russian villages. So communication was constant, even though not constant to the point of uh, intermarriage, of course. But pogroms were also quite frequent. A pogrom is uh, the Russian authorities sending troops to these Jewish settlements and taught them a lesson. Their rates, where people were killed and their possessions were uh, destroyed. Here, um, music was always uh, important to, to uh, Jewish people and there would always be a violinist, or a fiddler, rather, in the village. And so when people would get together and uh, uh, a fiddle would be played uh, and uh, would be heard throughout uh, throughout the village, and that's what he portrays here. He's using, of course, he's using uh, cubist forms as well as fauve colors, and he combines it all together in his reminiscences of these villages. And uh, uh, it's all it's quite flat. You see log cabins here. You see the people walking around in the Russian costume. Here's one violinist, the Russian church, another Russian church. Here's another. Uh, somebody is flying in the sky, uh, there is no rhyme or reason, there is a little dog barking at him, as a dog may have been barking uh, back in the village. Uh, he is called the green violinist, he could have been called a, a green-faced violinist. I mean, the color is completely irrational. And, and they had said before, Chagall himself said, uh, whoever tries to, to read meanings into my paintings are wasting their time, because, uh, because there isn't any. This is just what I see, and this is how I paint, and... Uh, there's no moral to the story, it's just that painting is my life and I can't do without it. And this is how I do it. That's the long and the short of it. And if, it's, if it pleases someone aesthetically, or from the point of view of um, uh, 
an example of uh, an early 20th century art, which of course it's a brilliant example because the space is flattened completely, the images are cubist, uh, there's a great deal of overlapping of, of imagery and bleeding into one another, transparencies, all of it is there. But presented from the point of view of Russian Jewish immigrant. So from, the, from those perspectives, absolutely, those are very interesting paintings. But as to the deeper meaning, there isn't any. Here is and the same thing. I and the village. What we see here, <laughs> everything is uh, is upset turvy. Uh, here is a villager with his side, and then, and then there's uh, there's a woman upside down. Uh, again, no rhyme or reason to that. It's just that he felt that aesthetically, it would be more interesting if they if they were presented uh, uh, this way. There is a horse, a green face here, a tree. Um, there is a, a cow and a milkmaid. So in this, in one canvas, he so he sort of realized the Picasso's um, the Picasso's idea of seeing everything simultaneously. Uh, it's not just that we go down, we go in the village down one street and we only see the houses. We also know what is going on. We know that somebody is working in the field. We know that uh, somebody is bringing water uh, on the yoke. Uh, we know that somewhere the cow is being milked. I mean, all of this. We know. So what he's doing here is presenting it all together, and uh, the fellow right there uh, might as well be our green uh, uh, or blue violinist, green, in this um, in this case. And you can see how this uh, very much lends itself to stained glass, and he'll work a lot in stained glass. In fact, um, the two very large windows in the vitrines in the Metropolitan uh, Opera are by Chagall in New York. Considerably later, this is Bella, his beloved wife, and she will write a memoir. And at some point, uh, she will talk about how they were still they were still in Russia, and she found out about his birthday, and rushed to bring him to bring him flowers, and she brought them in this large shawl, and he was just so happy about it. He was ecstatic, and uh, and he immediately began painting. Immediately, he jumped to his palette and and, and began to paint. And here are the shawls, the shawl here, the shawl there, here are the flowers. He is so ecstatic, he's just uh, flying in the air. Here, look, the Arnold Fini portrait. He did know his history of art. And this essentially, uh, in a way, it's going back to that. Uh, here is a man and a wife, and, um, and the two of them are entering into some sort of a contract. And the draperies around the bed, and the bed, of course, the mirror, the window. And, uh, and here we have it. There's the bed. And the draperies. I mean, there's a little dog. Well, the dog is probably hiding under under the bed, so that's why we don't see the dog. But uh, but otherwise, so he has flowers. They have tangerines over uh, on the windowsill. Uh, so the idea, uh, the idea is not dissimilar. It's just one is one is done in the 15th century, and the other one is done in the 20th. But what he added, of course, to it is the madness and the joy. And then back in Paris, he is looking at Paris through the windows, and what do we see? Of course, we see our, our uh, ubiquitous Eiffel Tower, because by now, since 1889, uh, it began to symbolize Paris very much. He's, set, he's sitting in his studio. The colors are kind of uh, red, white, and blue, which are uh, American colors, but they're also French colors, so the colors of the French flag. And um, the whole painting is, is uh, indulged with them. Uh, the, uh, if it's divided in terms of uh, in terms of composition, the uh, the tower provides the, ver the verticality that on the left the window is providing, and here sits a human-headed cat, and on the other side sits well perhaps Chagall himself, but he is a two-faced Janus who is uh, an ancient Roman god of January because one year ends and the other year begins, but it is also. Uh, well, it's a double vision, it's a multiple vision, in fact, that the artist has, that he does not necessarily see Paris as it is, he sees it in his mind, full of color and joy and, uh, um, and glory. And uh, so uh, a man has many uh, thoughts, thoughts inside one's, one's head, and so the double-faced image conveys that. Uh, the colors, of course, are very brilliant, and here, so we see the studio here, the... Uh, the cat. Uh, <laughs> there go. There's a priest and um, and just a pedestrian, and they are represented as uh, on the 
on a horizontal scale, but then Chagall has been uh, defying gravity ever since he began. He picked up uh, uh, the brush. Everybody, I mean, so many people in his paintings they fly and they uh, and they go up and they walk upside down or they walk, or, or they walk horizontally. So defying gravity, of course, is one of the uh, principles of cubism in the first place. De defying logic. And these are, these are the flying lovers of Vitebsk. It was a fantastic marriage. Uh, they, they loved each other very, very deeply. And he just, uh, as I said, he kind of lived uh, a life like Matisse. A very fortunate life, incredibly fortunate life. And so there's no sadness in his, um, in his art. Which one would think, my God, being, being born Jewish in Russia and then, uh, and then getting, getting away before the Second World War, where so many Jews were, of course, deported to concentration camps, and, and, and the French were not too merciful. They were happy to denounce. Uh, it was amazing that he just went through that entire century, lived 98 years, and, um, and pretty much lived a very exciting, very full life, full of love, uh, full of art, full of very interesting people around. And, um, and so his art, very different from Matisse, of course, but uh, borrows from Matisse in terms of color very much. But, um, yeah, uh, joyous art, as you see here. Everybody was so uh, in love with Chagall that, I mean, it depends on one's opinion, of course, and, and in the case with the opera, uh, the Paris opera, um, opinions differ. It, it's, it's an incredibly over-the-top, lush, belle époque building. It's, it, it just, it's over Baroque. It's, it's quite astonishing, actually. And, um, but it felt that it has to stay with modern times as well. So what they did, you see the frescoes in the ceiling, which are also uh, Belle Epoque paintings that look back at, uh, uh, at Baroque and Rococo ceiling paintings of Italy and Spain and, uh, and Austria. And they fit with the style perfectly. They, they're allegorical painting that, that has the muses, of course, the arts, etc. But the Paris Opera felt that they needed something fresh and they needed something new in their decor. So they destroyed the original fresco on the ceiling and they asked Chagall to design uh, what you see here. It's strange, it's just strange, but it just doesn't fit the vibe. But, uh, um, perhaps you've been or if you will go uh, at some point and you take a tour of the opera, which one can do without going and seeing a performance. I mean, the whole thing is so lush and uh, just uh, so extraordinary uh, with, with, these, with these Baroque elements preeminent everywhere. You, you, you sort of want to put on your best dress and, uh, and promenade down the, uh, the, the great corridor. Uh, and then you come into the main hall and, and look up and it just, yeah, it doesn't exactly, it just goes very much against uh, against the, um, the vibe. We are kind of in a fantasy world now and another artist that uh, was very compelling at the time will be Giorgio de Chirico. He was an Italian born in Greece and his father was a, a, a railroad engineer so they moved quite a bit uh, and so he will grow up in Greece and of course imbibe all these ancient auras and then they'll go to München, to Munich and there he'll be uh, exposed to various other art. But the classical feel will always be there in his art. Uh, he is kind of the father of surrealists, and we'll talk more about surrealists. But uh, André Breton, who will be the leading spirit of the surrealists, admired de Chirico until the time when he decided, enough of this, I'm just going back to classical art, and that's where I'm going to stay. And then, <laughs> and then André Breton just excluded him. From the, from the membership, literally. Here he is, and uh, he is painting his, uh, his own portrait with the statue of Mercury, who was the messenger of the gods. And it seems that the Kiriko saw himself a bit in the same, in the same fashion. And the olive, interestingly, the, uh, the, the olive leaf, as you see, these olive, uh, he, he paints them around his head as well, that, that uh, his head is certainly ready for the olive leaf as well. His painting is always evocative, is always mysterious, and that's how he likes it to be. Um, yes, before I start, he, um, he founded the, another movement that will be called the Metaphysica art movement. Um, again, let's remember 
our Madame Blavatsky and her theosophy. And of course he was he grew up in, as a child in Greece and the metaphysics, uh, metaphysics means beyond the natural appearances or beyond the natural reasoning, meta, beyond. Uh, that doesn't mean that these painters were philosophers, they weren't, or that they were psychiatrists, they weren't. Uh, as I said, Dr. Freud is busy now scribbling, of course, but uh, they're all very much influenced by him. Uh, so what they meant by these words is not quite clear, to be honest, uh, nor probably was entirely clear to them. Just another word that seems to express uh, the uh, the mystery the mystery of their mentality the mystery of their uh, psychology um, he spent much time in Turin in the north of Italy so many of these paintings in fact uh, feature uh, the uh, cityscape of uh, of Turin and uh, here's the mystery and melancholy of a street so here we have uh, what appear to be classical arches but they completely lack any decoration whatsoever. And uh, same thing here. And in fact, they do exist in Turin, this kind of row of arches, but with moldings. Here, he excludes all molding completely, whether on the, on the doors or on the windows. Um, there's a flag uh, that blows in the wind, and the old-fashioned uh, railroad car that seen that with the doors open, and it seems beckoning, uh, threateningly, uh, for the girl to, to, to go inside. Uh, and then the girl that almost seems lifted from the Grand Jatte, to remember the Grand Jatte, the, uh, the Seurat painting, and there's one girl, that, that the rope jumper, that jumps the rope and uh, she's the only one who in fact moves. And this seems as a nod to, to the Grand Jatte, because there's the, the girl not with the jumping rope but with a hoop, who is, and, and, and almost not even, almost a shadow of her, and she is running towards another shadow that appears threatening. And it's very well, it's, it, it very well may be that it's not a man there or a woman, it may just be a statue, because these old Italian cities, they are, they're all very full of 19th century figures of statue. And then melancholy in this case is perhaps the evocation of um, these old cities that, uh, that were built very much in classical style, but uh, with all these new movements, every new movement comes around and wants to sweep away the old, such as the futurists. So uh, it's possible that there is melancholy and nostalgia for the old because the sun is setting. His sun is always setting. And as a result, the shadows are very, very, very long. So as the sun sets and uh, humanity diminishes or goes to bed, the shadows become longer and the melancholy and, and nostalgia more acute. Here's another one, and this is the soothsayer's recompense. Soothsayer's summon clairvoyant, and what does summon clairvoyant see? It's the same, same idea in the middle of the painting uh, is reclining a statue of Ariadne, and Ariadne was a Minoan princess, the daughter of King Minos of Crete, who helped um, a Greek by the name of Theseus, a, her a hero, to defeat, to, to, uh, to defeat the Minotaur who lived on the island of Crete. And then she fell in love with him and ran away with him from Crete. But, uh, but on the way back home, Theseus abandoned her on, um, on an island and left her to be by herself. Fortunately for her, a god Dionysus, as he, uh, as he rode in the sky, saw her, fell in love with her and made her his wife. So things ended up well for Ariadne. You see again the classical forms, the classical arches. Here is some, some sort of a triumphal arch of sorts, but, but interpreted in, in, in a very economical, uh, modern terms. And here too. And the only two things really that are contemporary that you see uh, is the uh, one is the um, clock on the, uh, on the tower, and another is the train that is leaving, presumably taking tissues away um, with it. And the whole idea of a clock on presumably a classical building uh, is, is, is in a way an oxymoron. Those classical buildings were built long before the clock was uh, uh, invented. Um, but again, that, that same melancholy nostalgia, I mean, in, in, in these cities very often in modernity, the old buildings were, were indeed uh, made to serve contemporary needs. And it, it could very easily be that uh, an old building would become a railroad station. But uh, the old is uh, slipping away, leaving 
uh, Ariadne all alone on on the deserted uh, on a deserted square. I think I like the Kiriko best so far. I know I love the Kiriko. It's kind of what we talked about before with with um, Van Gogh and with Kollitz. Yes. The, the, their rule, the, the way that they use the modern uh, manias, the new fads in art, to instead of just using them as a fad, but instead right. of using them to, to convey... So truly to express their... Yeah, you kind yeah. of feel that de Kirko is part That's of that the same tradition. Thing. He also is Ariadne, and there's another train, and you can see a train and a tall ship with the uh, sails, and, and this juxtaposition of the old and the new. And the same here at the tower. This tower, I think, exists in Turin. It's the same arches and um, and our Ariadne line there, all abandoned, all abandoned by modernity, while her own ship sails away. And here we come. This is we're going to spend a bit of time on it because this shows his entrance into a different world and his abandonment of the world of what of cubism, of fauvism, in fact, even of Surrealism. And then Sylvia Plath wrote the poem, in fact, about this. I'm going to read the poem and then I will explain uh, the painting according to the poem. But this is a good exercise in uh, the combination that existed at the time uh, of literature and art, sometimes music and art, and how it all worked very much together. So here's a lady sitting with her back to us in a classical garb. In front of her, is he sitting or standing? It's unclear. He is wearing a three-piece suit, not not uh, not sadly row, but uh, probably off the rack. But so she is clearly more elegant. And then just above him is a painting uh, of a Grecian male head that, in fact, looks like him, right there. there and there are no walls. So what does it all mean? Uh, the Kiriko did not uh, did not explain. So at least Sylvia Plath wrote a poem. Here we go. Through portico of my elegant house, you stalk with your wild furies, disturbing garlands of fruit and the fabulous lutes and peacocks, rending the net of all decorum which holds the whirlwind back. Now a rich order of walls is fallen, rooks croak above the appalling ruin. In bleak light of your stormy eye, magic takes flight like a daunted witch quitting castle when the real days break. Fractured pillars frame prospects of rock. While you stand heroic in coat and tie, I sit composed in Grecian tunic and psyche knot, rooted to your black look, the play turned tragic, which such blight wrought on our bankrupt estate, what ceremonial words can fetch that havoc. Did you get it? Got it's it. hard. Well, here's the pictorial background. We can go through that. It is based on the painting, and the painting presents, as I said, the uh, man and the woman in a room, open door, no walls, blurred boundaries. The inside is also the outside, and so the landscape becomes the interior, and the interior becomes the landscape. Uh, the woman looks nostalgically beyond the suit towards. Well, this claims that she is looking at this uh, at this fellow above him, as if to compare the two and find the living one wanting. The Greek hero, she prefers, clearly. And the discrepancy between modern art and ancient indicates the conflict between the man in his untidy contemporary suit and the woman in her tasteful uh, Grecian, um, Grecian tunic. Well, the suit is a bit off the rack. The Kiriko uh, implicitly uses the view to suggest a psychologically disharmonious male-female relationship. These differences predict an inevitable failure of the conversation. In the first stanza, the first octave, the speaker illustrates a vivid description of the male destitution. The furious man intrudes into the woman's orderly wife, orderly life. Thank you. <laughs> he wants her to be an orderly wife. Oh, right. <laughs> Smashing her dream of love. The conception of the blasting whirlwind denotes the male lover's ravaging power. Images such as elegant house, garlands of fruit, and the fabulous lutes and peacocks, rich order of walls, which represent female elegance, contrast with images of male vulgarity, such as wild furies, whirlwind, and stormy eyes. I don't know, Stormy Eyes is not necessarily vulgar. Okay, now the second, the second stanza we're going to presents a ruptured relationship. The man who stands heroic in coat and tie 
finds no emotional interaction with the woman who sits composed in Grecian tunic and psyching off. Psyching off is the thing of her hair. There is no communication between them since no ceremony or words can patch the havoc. The poem is not a conversation between two persons, rather it is a resentful monologue of a female speaker. So, and thus we have the explanation. You gotta love it when it's, what is it, a resentful monologue? Right, a resentful monologue. You gotta love it when it's called a resentful monologue when he's clearly the one who's coming to her living room. I know. Platt's vividly descriptive poem expands on the theme of the picture and establishes a vision of the devastating effect of a male lover on the uh, female persona. Both the, the Kiriko painting and Platt's poem uh, indicate similar themes about male-female relationships. I don't know, she doesn't look so oppressed to me. She's, uh, she's rather the queen of the, uh, of the hearth. She's, uh, she's the one who is staring him down. He's about to run away. The door is already open. She pushed the button for the, bond, for the doors to open. Out. Out you go. As you see, this is still Kiriko. He just completely leaves uh, psychology, leaves uh, cubism and futurism. <laughs> he leaves it all. And he just goes back to the quiet waves of classicism. And uh, he likes it there. And here again, these are the two horses again going back to classicism. I suppose once you grew up in Greece, it's very difficult to separate oneself from that incredibly ancient and very powerful tradition. And uh, older as a young man, a young woman, you go out in the world and search for, for various other ways. Uh, I can see how the pull of this tradition would be very, very difficult to escape, sort of as one returns to type, one returns to a powerful tradition that one grew up with. So, uh, these two horses, Balios and uh, Xanthus, uh, Poseidon gave these two horses to King Peleus when he married um, the uh, uh, mother of Achilles. And then, uh, and then Achilles got the horses and uh, brought them with him uh, to the walls of, uh, of Troy. There was a third horse who was as powerful. He was not immortal, but he was as swift and as glorious as the divine horses. And he is the one who, uh, who will be killed. And then it, it seems that uh, Achilles' comrade in arms, Patroclus, used to feed and groom these horses. And uh, it, in the Iliad it is told how uh, when Patroclus was killed in battle, that these horses cried. And uh, this is what uh, the Kiriko represents, these two horses. The two horses mourning, mourning perhaps the past, the mourning there, these remnants of uh, ancient columns. The, uh, the sky is turbulent. You see a turbulent sky, there's trouble uh, in paradise. Um, and the horses, of course, are represented from much more a classical perspective. Okay. And thus we arrive, uh, thus we arrive at the, uh, at an important, sort of a movement, it's kind of as a state of mind, uh, which will be called Dada, and uh, it will exist in different cities almost simultaneously. It will start simultaneously in New York and in Zurich, and then it will move to Berlin, and then, uh, I mean, it moved with the people. In 1916, the war already lasted two years, the First World War, and uh, it was very apparent what a horror and what uh, indescribable butchery that war was turning out to be. And um, so a number of young men and women uh, came to Switzerland, which was neutral. So they, they wouldn't be subscribed and the, they, they wouldn't enter the war. And they formed this, um, uh, as I said, it's difficult to call it society or movement. It's more of a state of mind. They were young rebels. They, um, they, uh, they felt uh, that the logic, uh, the education, the rational thinking brought society to suicide, to the most horrendous suicide that's ever been witnessed on Earth, the First World War. And, uh, and then nothing really had meaning anymore. It wasn't futurism that, was, that believed in technology. They believed in nothing, these people. Uh, and they saw, in fact, now they saw what technology was uh, capable of and, uh, and what butchery, uh, technological warfare, was wreaking on humanity. Uh, the, uh, I mean, the entire generation of young men will disappear in that uh, butchery, uh, leaving young women, widows, unwed, childless. So they did not believe in technology anymore. They also did not believe in the... Uh, in the past. They did not believe in the present 
they believe absolutely in nothing. So they felt if art had any future at all, it was the art of, of chance. And one of the uh, proponents was uh, Jean Arp, or Hans Arp. Uh, and uh, what he would do, I mean, what you see, he would just cut up little pieces of little squares uh, of paper and make them fall on the floor and see how they uh, were laid out. And that's how he felt the art uh, was going to. And the movement began in Zurich uh, with a couple of people uh, forming the so-called uh, Cabaret Voltaire, Hugo Ball and Emmy Hennings. There was just a cafe culture in general, the intellectual cafe, where people would get together and find, uh, and find uh, similar souls, with similar interests. And, uh, and that's where they gathered in these cafes. And so, so in Zurich, they uh, established a little place called Café Voltaire. And Voltaire, of course, was... Uh, um, was a brilliant 18th century wit and a famous critic, of course, of, uh, of uh, autocracy and, uh, and human folly. And that's why they called it Café Voltaire. And then to this place, I mean, at first it was a literary movement, uh, uh, a musical movement, and what they would do there, for instance, they would give nonsensical concerts. In other words, everybody would bring their instrument and, and play whatever. And, and this cacophony of music, this cacophony of different instruments, was applauded as uh, as the new music. Same was with um, poetry. Uh, they would they would cut up a newspaper and um, and cut out words from a newspaper, place them in bags, and then shake the bag and start pulling out the words from the bag, putting them together. So that was the poetry. The art of nonsense. The the art of humanity gone mad. Uh, and that's that was their commentary. And the same thing spilt into art. No one, no one really knows where the word Dada comes from. Um, uh, in Russian it means yes, yes. And in French, I gather, it means a hobby horse, Dada, but no one knows. Uh, but a number of these people who were just angry with the world, extremely angry, and uh, lucky not to be uh, part of the war and not to be uh, murdered by the war. They also make commentary on fetishes. Uh, they were done with the isms too, and uh, this uh, Jean Arp, his own fetish for whatever reason was a navel. He began to cut out these wooden forms and superimpose them on one another, uh, and there would always be a navel there. So, uh, and this is called a torso. So, whether it's female torso or male torso, we don't know. Uh, in in some cases, I think he actually hired uh, a woodworker to do the stuff for him, and he just directed him. Or he would do the same thing with scissors and... Uh, How does that count? How does that count? Everything counted. Okay. Count as what? That's the thing. Count as what? As his art. Well, the question is, I mean, they questioned the, the whole idea of art. And yet they wanted to produce something that... Uh, they wanted to produce anti-art, almost. They were horrified by what happened to Western civilization. And, uh, I mean, this is 1920. This is already after the war. But the movement continues, this whole Dada thing. But anything goes. Uh, whatever comes into their mind, they express. And they now can express it in, um, in found objects. They can express it in motor objects. Picasso showed them uh, how to uh, plan a sculpture. And that's essentially what, what uh, Jean Arp is doing here too. Um, here, he created a, a series of multi-layered painted wood reliefs, as, it, as you see here. You almost see a uh, hammer and sickle here too. He perfected the assemblage technique. And yes, here, yeah, he had a carpenter do this thing for him. So he would uh, he would draw his uh, shapes. The, the Americans were still very much in the 19th century uh, in terms of their art. I mean, obviously they they heard uh, about what is happening, but then it just so happened that a couple of artists in New York decided to acquaint America with all the uh, the uh, modern art uh, tendencies that were happening in Europe. So they would go to Europe and they selected a whole number of, uh, of art that they uh, brought to, uh, to New York City in, uh, in 1913. And that was the, uh, the very uh, famous uh, exhibition in the, uh, in the New York Armory building and still exists, still holds exhibits. And of course, reaction was just um, <laughs> unbelievable. No one, the, the American public really just 
couldn't believe what they were seeing. They, their idea of art simply uh, did not encompass what they considered as um, <laughs> utter nonsense. Uh, at the same time, they felt uh, I mean, that there was a, a great deal of insecurity uh, among the American artists that they weren't stepping together with Europe and a great deal of curiosity about it. So they ultimately were willing to accept uh, even what the public considered the unacceptable. And uh, art historian Serge Gilbon once said New York stole the idea of modern art from Europe. And this is where it will start next time. Thank you and uh, goodbye.